to keep it to one hour and I'm going to do a very short introduction, nothing lengthy. And so our first intern that you'll hear from is Callie Smith and she's um, a rising sophomore at UChicago. And Callie, when you are ready, you can get started. She um, did work at Northwestern. So she will talk with you about her project and her work there. Okay, I'm sharing the screen. So can everyone see the screen? Good. Okay, cool. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Callie Smith. Like Allison said, I'm a sophomore at University of Chicago. Um, and I worked on a project at Northwestern with uh, the, uh, another intern, Malik, and we were documenting Black student experiences. It was an oral history project. So just a, a little more detail about the project. Again, the goal was to document the experiences of Black students who attended Northwestern in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, we had four narrators for this project, and they were all international students from Africa. So um, they're from Africa and then they came to Northwestern to attend either undergraduate or graduate school. And we decided to ask the narrators uh, questions based on a few themes or based around a few themes, uh, generally like a chronological theme, uh, starting with their lives and their backgrounds before attending Northwestern. Um, and then once they got to Northwestern, their academic and social life, um, any community activism or student activism that they participated in during their time. Um, and then their lives and careers after Northwestern. Um, so we wanted to get a good picture of any impact that attending Northwestern and their experiences that they had while they were at Northwestern had on their lives overall. And so next I wanna take some time to just reflect on the type of work that I did. Um, Southwest Highway, Palos Heights, Illinois. I'm sorry. Sorry, I think we had a little audio. Um, so now I, I just wanted to take some time to talk uh, and reflect on my work that I did um, during uh, the internship and over the summer. Um, and I started, we started with doing background research. Um, so uh, background research on Northwestern's history in the 60s and the 70s um, and, and learning a lot of things about names of buildings and Africa House and um, certain events like the bursar's office takeover, which was uh, uh, had to do with housing discrimination. Um, so just understanding the circumstances that um, the students were coming into. Um, and then we also did preliminary research on each of our narrators, um, you know, uh, just Googling them. I even found a few of their social medias. Uh, so things of that nature. Um, and then during this time, the initial uh, weeks of the internship, we decided to meet with our supervisors almost daily throughout the internship. And I think it was a great way uh, to combine a collaborative and guided work on this project. And I also believe it gave me um, independence to do my own thing and then share my findings the next day. Um, and so the research that we did helped a lot in curating questions that we would ask the narrators. And while we did have these um, thematic sections that we split the interview questions into, we could tweak each section based on our research and based on what we found out about the narrators um, to, give it a, to give it a more specific uh, interview experience. Um, I was also responsible after the interview uh, to, uh, for transcribing two of the interviews. Uh, the transcription process was long, but it was really rewarding. <laughs> Um, going through the words of our narrators so many times, like, allowed me to pick up on some stories that I actually missed during the initial interviews, which was crazy to me. Um, so, for example, one of the narrators uh, tells a story about traveling to the United States uh, and in the process of traveling, it, it's late one night and they hear uh, the song Stranger in Paradise playing uh, from like a shop or something. And that song made such an impact on them that it became the first record that they purchased once they were in the United States. And I didn't hear that story until I was transcribing, which I thought was crazy and insane. So each interview ended up feeling so important to me that 
getting each story and every single word right was imperative. And again, I think the fact that we met frequently provided a nice balance of guiding and checking my work because this was my first time doing this type of work and also giving me a good sense of responsibility about the work I was tasked with. Um, we attended and participated in pre-interviews and interviews which all took place over Zoom. Um, and I never thought about pre-interviews as a step to conducting an interview, just kind of shows how much I didn't know, but I learned just how important that they were in making the environment as comfortable as possible for the narrator and making sure since these were Zoom interviews that everything was Zoom would run right. Um, and I was also able to participate in the pre-interviews by telling the narrators about the specific themes that we would ask them about, which I thought was great. Um, overall, it was a fantastic experience because the narrators had so many stories to tell um, and, and they were telling stories about places and around circumstances I had just familiarized myself with through the research that I had done. Um, an example of this is a quote that I thought was really interesting. Uh, that's from a Daily Northwestern article. The quote I have on the screen, it's talking about um, international students uh, feeling excluded from specifically Greek life and um, social experiences at Northwestern University. And I was so struck when during the interview, we were able to ask the narrator about this same sort of experience. And we were able to gain knowledge of the exclusion that they felt as an international student from Africa um, and, and their experience with being excluded from Greek life in certain social situations. Um, so to sum it all up, I wanted to talk about uh, my visit to the Northwestern libraries. Um, we actually got to tour. That was uh, our tour guides were our fantastic supervisors. Um, but I'd like to talk about this experience because I think looking back on it and because the internship was remote, being able to spend the day in a place where my internship would have taken place was a really good way for me to think about what was impactful for me about this entire internship experience. I was of course able to meet everyone working on the project with me, which was fantastic. And I was also able to see so many versions of what a career in archival and library sciences looks like. Um, touring Herskovitz uh, Library of African Studies and walking through the stacks of archival materials was a great supplement to the many lessons uh, I had been learning all the summer through research and interviews and transcription. This was such a rewarding and enlightening experience for me overall, and I'm forever grateful for it. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Callie. Thank you very much. That was great. So next we will hear from Rebecca Otto. And Rebecca is a graduate student at DePaul University. And she did, an, um, she did her internship this summer at, at uh, Chicago History Museum. Rebecca, when you're ready. Hello, hello. All right, I'm going to get this queued up. But while I get it ready, I apologize in advance. I'm getting over a small allergy attack. So oh. if I, my voice breaks up, that is why. Alrighty, so I had the privilege, um, like Allison mentioned, of working with the Chicago History Museum this summer. Um, and we worked on a, a project called the AAPL, so Afro-American Police Patrolman's League Oral History Project. Um, and the goal at the start of this was to conduct six interviews and one transcription. And true to COVID fashion, that is not what happened. Um, however, I still had an incredibly meaningful internship experience and something that I could not have predict predicted or foreseen coming into it. So what did this internship look like? Um, there's like very two very distinct portions of this interview, or excuse me, of this internship. And so the first one was like just bonding with BMRC. So we had some snack and chats and that just looked like community building with other interns. Um, there were lots of funny moments and also moments that kind of helped um, even encourage my own work at CHM by hearing how maybe the Northwestern crew was handling their oral history. Um, there were my 
weekly or bi-weekly check-ins with Allison, which as much as coming into this, um, I we would joke that like we would set up a 15-minute check-in and easily talk for over an hour. There were some workshops that were very informative and informational interviews, which I'll talk a, a little bit more about later, and enrichment activities. Um, and then for the CHM portion, I I still do not have enough words to articulate how incredible it was to work at a museum. Um, I've done a lot of work with libraries in the past and quite a bit of work with oral histories, um, but CHM truly made me and my co-intern, um, Kristen, feel really welcomed. And so we had exposure to regular meetings, whether that was appraisals or collections. Um, we had a lot of support getting this project off the ground because we were very much starting from scratch. And then we had, some beautiful check-ins as well. Um, and so as much as like all of that composed a really wonderful internship experience, something I didn't see coming into this was this trauma interviewing portion. And so as we were curating questions for the interviews we hoped to obtain this summer, um, something I recognized through countless hours of research, both on Chicago and policing in the 1960s and 70s, and why the Patrolman's League was so necessary to the Black community in Chicago, while we're like looking at all of this, something that easily stood out to me was the fact that there's so much trauma and so much trauma that continues today. Um, especially, I think everybody's aware of different things that are happening in our political climate right now. So going into thinking through these interviews and thinking through how the pandemic impacts um, even just our basic conducting of these interviews, I recognize the need for a trauma-informed approach. So when I brought this up to my team and I was thinking through like, you know, if, if we were in person and if I was interviewing somebody about heavy, difficult, traumatic topics, um, you know, there would be a lot of body language happening and I would be able to like stop and say, hey, do you need a glass of water? Can I get you a tissue? Can we do this? Um, obviously, in a virtual world, we can't do that the same way. Um, and so I was very much strategizing, how do we keep our interviews um, and our interviewees not even just efficient, but robust by providing additional support? How do we do that? And so um, when I was encouraged by my supervisor, Angela, to go down that rabbit trail and do that research and create a little trauma-informed document, I realized there was not a lot of that information specifically for archiving and oral histories for the archiving world. Um, the tools and resources I was finding were very much like for police or even um, for psychologists, just very like different disciplines. And I, a lot of my work as a master's student um, encompasses trauma and, it, and talks through like, how do we give someone full dignity while not negating the reality of their story. And so um, from this, I kind of started to carry that into my check-ins with Allison. Um, and we started to have more conversations about like, where, why is there a, a gap in this research? Like, why don't we as archivists or in this world, why isn't there more um, of a consideration perhaps to supporting people through the telling and remembering of their story and even how that informs the way we preserve those stories. Um, so this, this piece, again, as much as that wasn't the goal per se, um, was something that I am going to carry with me because I just see it connect easily, um, not just to this world, but even our day-to-day -day life, especially now in a pandemic, right? And acknowledging the fullness of, in this project Specifically, what did it mean to be a Black policeman in Chicago from the 1960s and 70s and beyond? What does it mean to be a person who probably has other instances of trauma in their life? And what does it mean um, to carry that forward now in a, a world where people are regularly saying COVID-19 has caused trauma for folks? Um, and so as much as I wanted to execute this with specific oral history interviews and I wasn't able to, um, something I'll share like a small moment was a potential interviewee that it just didn't work out in the, the time span to get his story um, was when I did independent research for him to prepare for that interview um, when we thought it was going to happen. I recognized that there was a humongous instance of trauma we would have never known about um, that impacts his life right now that he experienced after retiring from the police force, after retiring from AACL, 
Um, and that was a very daunting, like finding these different news articles and seeing how like he's carrying this with him in his future um, was very daunting. But because we had created this trauma-informed guide, because we had extensively workshopped this idea, because there was so much support from CHM, um, I felt prepared to do it, even though it, it didn't end up happening due to scheduling issues. Um, so something I want to touch on is, I think, um, talking to folks in my life about this internship, um, it's easy to get lost in, well, you didn't do the goal that you had, Rebecca, so like, what, what was the point of this? Um, and truly, more than just the practical skills that I'm carrying with me, more than the passion and zest I have for archiving, um, now that I've had a different experience with it, more than all of that, um, I've truly been amazed by the incredible people I've met throughout this internship. And so this is an excerpt from my paper. I will read it and then I will explain it. Um, but it just kind of captures this theme of human connection and the stories that we're preserving. So project archivist Donna Edgar described her current project as the basement mysteries. It centers on uncovering documents left in a museum basement. At times she stumbles upon treasures or fragments that belong in a larger collection, while at other times, not so much. When I asked her how she stays motivated, she said that while so many different cultures have been lost on the shelf, her work allows her to unbury them, advocate for them, and help them find a home. Donna's interview echoed the zest and candor of Angela Solis, um, my supervisor and CHM archivist. Her journey into the world of archives is unexpected. Yet, in this work, she has found immense purpose like Donna. Angela sees her work as, as a shining light, is shining a light on stories that face obstacles getting onto the shelf. My vocation is helping those little stories get told and helping them last. While this internship was an unexpected journey, the connections I made with others led me to think critically, not only of the stories we tell, but also how we obtain, protect, and remember those stories. Um, and that, like, I, I wish there was enough time and enough words to name all of the impactful people, to name even in my exit interview with Marty, which was another like, we're gonna set a 15 minute time and it's gonna end up being a 45 minute call. Um, but just the, the care, the care shown from um, professionals in this field that I look up to and I admire and I respect um, and them taking the time to not just Worries past, but to check thoroughly for understanding, to encourage, to uplift, to offer life advice, um, and to remind me of the type of advocate I hope to be in the future. And so this is definitely an experience that I'm going to take back to DePaul with me. Um, and then we're at the end, but a note that I wanted to, to last on was um, a quote from my supervisor who was incredible. You're doing enough and you deserve recognition, respect, and celebration. Um, and this stood out to me so loudly because I think myself being someone who does a lot of work with trauma um, and even looking at the totality of this internship and watching the way that it's so easy to get caught up in the details and are we doing enough and all the, the busyness of everything. Um, and this little reminder to celebrate Right? When you come to a little success, no matter how minuscule or unimportant, to just take that time and celebrate um, and how much stronger you can then approach whatever it is. For me, that's like heavy trauma work, um, but whatever that is, and to come to it again from a point of strength um, and even care for yourself. And so I hope all of the people in here who have been meaningful in this journey for me and have taken the time that you too can celebrate with me the success of this internship, even though there's a lot happening in the world. Um, it ended on a very good note. That's my presentation. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, so next we will hear from Jordan Wright and Jordan also worked um, this summer at the Chicago History Museum. He will share with you um, his work. Thanks, Jordan. And it's uh, currently on the uh, the uh, presentation. All right. Yes. 
So um, I worked with the Chicago History Museum um, and with Angela Hoover um, on the Rayburn Flairlish collection uh, in order to enrich the uh, metadata associated with that collection. So the Rayburn Flairlish collection is a collection of photographs by Rayburn Ray Flairlish. Um, he sort of was involved with the Midwestern music scene, especially the Chicago music scene sort of following the World Wars in the 50s to about the 70s. Um, he had multiple roles throughout the music world, such as a promoter, a sales representative, a lecturer, a showrunner, a critic, um, when he lived in Chicago. But the collection in particular documents uh, his photo photographs they took um, in Chicago during the, uh, the 60s and 70s of the music scenes of Chicago from the uh, jazz music scene to the folk and blues revivals that were happening at the time, especially in the 60s. Uh, especially Wells capturing these photographs was sort of this uh, picture of Black and integrated society and life in Chicago at the time, uh, especially not just the performers and the events, but the audiences and the people who organized the show from people like Joe Segal to certain um, urban leagues throughout Chicago that organized, say, certain um, benefit shows um, that you eventually started to learn about just by researching if they weren't for the photographs that I was sort of trying to find myself, trying to identify who these people were in these photographs. For the uh, project, uh, it was metadata enrichment for the archive and for the collection. So metadata was uh, sort of the data that provides information about other data. So in this case, sort of like the a title, a description, dates, locations, addresses, and community areas for the photographs was information that we were sort of adding to these photographs, especially the titles and descriptions, which didn't always specify say the names of the performers or the occasion of the performance or where it was or when. So go based on uh, sort of the very little information that was already available through finding aids or physical labels that were on the uh, on the or a uh, media or organization system itself, um, I began to research the, the photo sort of research events in the time period based on that information, looking at newspapers like the Defender and the Tribune, zines for example um there's a review called the little sandy review that was out of minnesota and it covered lots of folk music especially in the uh 60s but in particular it had multiple articles on the first three or four uh, university of chicago folk festivals so when i was trying to research the university of chicago folk festivals as far as which buildings these events were in or which events tend to be in which uh, buildings or say a lesser known artist who wasn't listening to advertisements at the time. It was a very sort of candid at the time source that not only provided sort of information on a more personal level that might not, might not have been available from more major sources like newspapers, but also provided sort of a like social context for the collection, which was very interesting. And then especially trying to research these, um, there's lots of deduction or process of elimination involved as far as trying to look at if someone couldn't be identified, say they don't have any photographs of themselves, trying to figure out, okay, who is at this show? Who have I already identified? Who plays what instruments or who has already shown up? And then just trying to narrow down who these people could be with the utmost certainty. So lots of cross-referencing multiple newspaper articles that might reflect changes in a show's program or say, that might rest with certain instruments or might be more or less descriptive. Um, looking at other photographs in the collection to see, well, maybe this person is with another person that I have identified, so this is clearly someone accompanying them at the time. One particular experience during this process of research was at the Downbeat Jazz Festival, which was a really interesting uh, sort of part of the collection to go through, because despite it being a very large festival in Chicago that was at Soldier Field, there's almost no contemporary sort of resource on it all. No Wikipedia pages. Most of the artists don't have it mentioned in their page at all. There was like one artist of the entire show who had a brief reference to this festival. So it was interesting to see that there was almost nothing about it nowadays. Very few photographs besides those in the Chicago History Museum collections. So I had to reference lots of newspaper advertisements, again, from the Defender and the Tribune. The problem was, is that there were many artists who were less like didn't have much staying power or maybe were less notorious at the time and weren't listening to advertisements and so they're more famous now but i couldn't match them with the people at the time so there's sort of two ways this like 
many artists who couldn't be identified. Um, one particularly confusing uh, instance of this was Art Blakey here, who was a drummer who led the uh, Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers, who is not listed in any itineraries for the show, including on the day that he performed. There, it, the other dates explicitly had and others listed, not the day he performed and he wasn't listed and I had no idea who he was. So after scouring through all these resources and having many blank spots, I found an article from the Downbeat magazine that was released more recently in the past decade or so, which was reflecting on this uh, concert. And so I managed to find out that our Blakey substitute for Miles Davis from this completely random resource that was sort of buried in these archives using a search that I didn't think this would come up for. I just found out that our Blakey substitute from Miles Davis who's injured. And then this person who was just like fondly remembering this uh, uh, festival from 40, 50 years ago, just listed off all of these names of different people and what instruments they played. All these people who had like no photographs of them, no sort of longer biographies of them available remotely. And the like list of uh, people that weren't identified just filled in after that. There was so many um, artists and groups who it was hard to identify before because there's little documentation of who was in the groups or what instruments they played or photographs on them to compare this saxophonist to this other saxophonist that just filled in as soon as I found that article. So using this information, um, I actually also created some resources for people that, that are continuing to work on the collection since this clearly wasn't the entirety of the collection. It was two events and then a series of miscellaneous photographs. So one of these was a Facebook, which um, was just sort of a document where I listed events, groups, and then artists along with photographs of them. And then it's not as visible in this picture because many of these were straightforward, but then trying to provide context clues for if this person shows up again, or if you aren't sure else identify a person to photograph based on the images, what to look out for. So for example, listing who they usually performed with, the size of the groups that they might have performed with, who they might have performed at a certain event, such as here, Jean Coltrane was accompanied by Archie Shep, who wasn't part of the quartet. And then certain things such as uh, sort of like where they usually performed, if maybe they didn't perform much in Chicago at the time, so it might not be that person. Um, and various changes to group composition, sort of referencing things like biographies. I reference Discogs a lot, just because that a pretty comprehensive list of group compositions and changes those compositions and what records they might have produced at the time. And then also between the Facebook and another document, providing resources for people that I hadn't ident identified yet, um, who maybe they'll show up later in the collection, or maybe there'll be some in-person source once uh, in-person work is a bit more accessible, such as the, I mean, that, that could be consulted to find these people. So maybe I identified where they're performing, what day, but I can't identify who because those articles don't exist and then providing that information for future resource uh, re researchers, along with a document of sources that I used, um, search tips as far as maybe common typos that appeared or certain formatting issues or like standardization even with the University of Chicago Folk Festival. But for the first three or four years, it wasn't consistently called the University of Chicago Folk Festival. So you have to, have to look more for the, uh, say, Ida B. I am, the Ida Noise Hall or the Mandel Hall in order to find resources about that. And then, like I said, uh, in-person sources that might have been helpful that I can access, like the John Steiner collection um, at the University of Chicago would be a very helpful collection to look at because that's like archives of posters and ephemera from all these jazz and blues venues in Chicago. And then for just like the tools that we used, um, an Excel spreadsheet was used to sort of put together the old data with the new data for research, like I mentioned before, the Defender and Tribune archives, the Chicago Public Library, the Internet Archive for things like the Sandy and Lil Sandy review zines, um, and then various online sources uh, at varying degrees of, uh, say, like officialdom, I guess you could say. So, so varying from things like the Defender and Tribune archives to maybe more personal blogs that I used to maybe corroborate if someone has a memory, but not primarily rely on those necessarily just because there, again, there's the issue of in-person and remote access with the uh, current pandemic. And then, although this isn't my part of the process, the information is uh, being put into the Chicago History Museum's image portal through Capture, um, which, although I'm not doing this, Angela, Angela um, Hoover did show me 
how to uh, how this information was sort of paired with the photographs in their system. And the experience overall was just um, I've been wanting to get into archives mostly because I'm really interested in making archival information and public history more accessible in general. Um, and this project was pretty much exactly that. It was providing this metadata, this information about these photographs that made it so that way on the Chicago History Museum website, you can search these records and find them based on just a even wider variety of information, names of venues, names of artists, locations, dates, events that they weren't necessarily sorted by before. And then even just, uh, for example, there are so many venues in these photographs that have almost no presence, sort of in a sort of online presence at all and very low presence and easily accessed like physical sources. So having this rich collection of photographs, these high quality photographs taken in these venues of people actually living their lives and going to these events in these venues that won't have, would have been easily found before was just like this amazing feeling to have as I found an unidentified venue and just had like dozens of photographs that now were like, this was definitely um, say the tree and ballroom, for example. And then even just um, making this like sort of integrated in Black life in Chicago more accessible in the South and West sides, there was one event at the tree and ballroom, which although I couldn't identify the exact occasion through the sources that were available to me, there was still just this context through the newspapers and all this that there were all these events for like urban leagues and various community organizations and just like high society lives in Black Chicago that are now all that more accessible because there is more information added to these resources and more context. And hopefully in the future that can continue to be enriched. And that was my presentation about uh, my internship. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you very much. That was great. And next, we will hear from Malik Pitchford and is a senior at DePaul. Um, I forgot to mention that Jordan is a recent graduate of DePaul. I think I did not say that. So just so you know. Malik, when you're ready. My screen is visible. All right. So hello, everyone. I am Malik Fitchford, and I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my experience participating in the documenting Black student experiences at Northwestern University in the 60s and 70s. But before I get into that, I figure it might be valuable to show some information about myself. Um, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm a senior at DePaul University, as Allison said majoring in political science, minoring in African and Black diaspora studies. And what made the BMRC generally, and then the Northwestern team specifically, a good match um, has to do with my like personal interests and academic interests, um, dealing with like Black and African um, political thinkers. I like reading texts that deals with the different aspects of like Black and African life, culture, politics, um, and so for those reasons, being paired with Northwestern University specifically, and then with the BMRC generally, um, and working with um, oral histories from alumni in the 60s and 70s, it was just a really good match. And so now specifically about the uh, documenting oral histories, um, First, let me go back. I think I skipped a slide. These are just some books that I've read recently to kind of give you an example of like the subject matter that I was previously interested in, which, which would make something like this a very pertinent um, internship. Um, one of them is The Negro Church in America by E. Franklin Frazier. Um, another one is Black Power, Radical Politics and African-American Identity by Jeffrey O.G. Ogbar. And then Black Milwaukee, The Making of an Industrial Proletariat, 1915 through 1945 by Joe William Schroeder. And then specifically about the internship, um, Florence and Sharla were extremely organized and helped make this experience as efficient as possible for all of us and for Callie and I. Um, so we were taught and given resources explaining the processes of conducting oral histories, which I was aware existed. I've looked at oral history or I've listened to oral histories, but I've never 
been a part of the process myself. Um, so this was a really rewarding process. Um, Florence and Charlotte had already selected, among others, four um, interviewees. Um, and not to repeat too much from what Callie said, but they were all um, alumni from, from Northwestern University in the 60s and 70s. And so once we found out who we were going to be interviewing, we researched their lives. We went through David Northwestern articles. Um, we went through newspaper profiles. Um, we looked into the history of Black residents in Evanston, um, the kind of context of Black people in the United States generally at that time. This is all with the goal of understanding the context of the interviewees, Northwestern, Evanston, the world, so that we might craft um, questions that were relevant and thought provoking that would provide for a productive interview for all of us. Um, the process of conducting the actual interviews was very interesting. We are remote, so it was of course done through Zoom. Um, Sharla and Florence conducted most of the heavy labor um, throughout the interview um, of making sure that the conversations stayed on topic um, and we didn't go too much over time, even though we pretty much went over time on every single one of them. Um, like I said, all the interviews went longer than expected because the interviews had a lot to share, which was great. Um, and some of them required a second session. Um, and then the process of transcribing was by far, as Callie said, the most tedious aspect of all of the work. Um, so when you're recording a Zoom session, Zoom can also auto-generate some transcripts, but they're not too accurate. So hours were spent um, with my computer on a split screen, listening to audio, going back to the text, trying to revise the text. Um, so you have to go back and edit. Um, you might have to turn the volume up. You might have to slow the audio down. You might have to speed it up. Some parts might be inaudible. Others might require um, one of your colleagues listening because maybe you just been you just been listening to the same audio for so long. You kind of just desensitized, and you need someone else to uh, use their fresh ears to figure out what is being said. Um, but we met as a group, as Kelly said, daily. Um, we went through a lot of the issues that we had together. And so it made the process very easy for us. And after the completion of, or a rough completion of the transcriptions, we looked at it as a group and then we submitted it to the interviewees um, so that we can make sure that we didn't misrepresent anything that they said, or maybe we got something wrong that we thought they said, but also we got a chance to meet um, each other in person for a day um, and tour Northwestern University's campus. And we got to see the facilities that Charlotte and Florence frequent on their day to day. We visited the Herskovich Library of African Studies, as Callie said. Um, we saw Florence's office. Um, we saw Northwestern's like very large, like newspaper archive, um, like warehouse room. Um, we saw rooms filled with special collections within the library. We seen a restoration lab where a group of people um, work specifically on repairing like paper or binding or things of that nature, which I would have never seen if it wasn't for this internship. Um, like I said, we met some of their colleagues as well. Um, and the tour was just filled with a lot of walking, but ultimately it was a great experience to see um, what Sharla and Florence are doing and the different aspects of what an internship or what a career in like archiving or to a lesser extent museum work, but maybe like a more academic setting um, could entail. And so I didn't take too many pictures of the tour just because I was kind of immersed in the tour, but, um, but my memory is still functional so I can remember the great experiences that I had. But with that being said, um, Florence pulled out some files from newspaper clippings that I think she said people were submitting um, to their office. And I just found three newspaper political cartoons that are kind of relevant to the internship. Um, the first one through the propaganda wall shows an African student running away from, from a building that says commie block education. 
um, the wall of books. You can read some of them, subversion, political indoctrination, compulsory, compulsory Lenin and Marx courses, brainwashing. Um, this next one is Volunteers for America. You can see it's from 1961. Um, it shows um, Gamal Nasser, the first president uh, or the second president of Egypt, um, Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, um, Ahmed Sekou Touré, the first president of Guinea, and they're talking to a Soviet uh, Peace Corps, or at least that's what its name pla uh, nameplate says. Then this last one is uh, Moise Tshombe, who was, I think, the leader after Patrice Lumumba was killed. Um, and these are all things that, well, some of the things that some of our interviews hit on, which I thought was pertinent, and it kind of um, it goes well with further research that I'm doing for my final presentation for Northwestern specifically, where we'll be talking to Charlotte and Florence and their colleagues um, and about that further um, further inquiry, I guess I'm doing. Um, going back to this, the, the political cartoons that I shared before, I'm interested in the Cold War context that informed the African Scholarship Program of the American Universities, which was a program that some of the interviewees came to America through. And so these programs were administered through public and private means, like the United States Association for International Development. I think that's what that stands for, USA, USAID. Um, and I'm, I want to use some of the quotes that the narr narrators gave us regarding the context of the Cold War and their choosing to come to the United States, whereas there are some people choosing to go to United Kingdom, some people that chose to go to um, go the Soviet route and have their education in Soviet Russia at that time. Um, but all this connects back to the internship as a whole. And I was able to kind of see a whole new world of career options and see what people are doing that I just was not aware of prior to this internship. And so for that, I'm very grateful that I had the experience that I had and I was able to work with some great people as well. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Malia. That was great, thank you. And the last intern we will hear from is Hope Houston. And Hope is a U Chicago student, a junior, and is working this summer with the Chicago Black Dance Legacy Project. So we'll hear from Hope about her work. When you're ready. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you, Allison, for the introduction. I am Hope. I'm the first archival intern for the Chicago Black Dance Legacy Project, and I'm gonna share a little bit about my experience thus far this summer. So a little bit about the project. So the Chicago Black Dance Legacy Project started in September, 2019. And a little bit of why the project started is based on um, a report uh, that was given in 2019 around the inequities of funding from the city of Chicago in regards to dance in institutions. So in this 2019 report, mapping the dance landscape in Chicagoland, it stated that 56% of grant philanthropic dollars were dedicated to three primarily white dance institutions, two of which are Joffrey Ballet and Hubbard Dance Street, Chicago. 9% of the city's funding went towards dance institutions of color, so racial and ethnic uh, dance groups across the city, which is a clear inequity because we all know that people of color make up more than half the population in Chicago. So that inequity around funding is why the project, part of why the project has started, and also it's featuring eight Black dance companies which are listed on the screen, helping them with capacity building, also building a network amongst the companies, and part of the internship is working towards documenting their history, their legacy, and also helping them learn how to continue to document their history, especially as new generations come in. And that's where I come in as an intern. So this summer, um, my work kind of had four different aspects. So 
first part is online research. So I was gathering information online, going through each company's website, other articles, YouTube videos, whatever I could find, um, and really going into a Google Drive, organizing it by the background, important people, dates, et cetera, so we can start building um, that list of information and also collecting any videos as well that are out there. Another aspect is going into the repositories. So I've been at Newberry Library quite a bit this summer working um, in their Anne Barzell Dance Research Collection, which has a lot of papers dedicated to a lot of the companies that are much older, like Deeply Rooted, Muntu, Joel Hall, et cetera. And so they have uh, a lot of newspaper clippings, articles, old programs, programs from Jacob Pillow's uh, Dance Festival um, that happened in the 90s things of that sort. So I've been able to scan those, collect those for the project's use and also um, for the companies to see as well, because some of them were not even aware that they had some information deposited in the Newberry. Another aspect of my internship has been in-person meetings. So I've had a hybrid internship where I've done some remote work, but also gone in person. So me and my supervisor, Princess, who has been great with guiding me this summer, um, were able to meet with each company a little one-on-one. -on -one. I was able to hear some of their stories, see the dance studio spaces, take pictures, gather some audio clips, um, and also just like get to know who these founders are and the work that they do and why do they do it. Um, so that was a wonderful experience, especially because I used to dance. So it was lovely being able to see dancers back into the studio space. Um, another aspect of the in-person part is a uh, retreat. So we actually had a retreat yesterday um, at the Logan Center where the dance companies uh, were able to come, we were able to bond, talk about the future of the project and get some of their feedback as well. And lastly, we have a Navy peer performance that's happening on August 28th, which I highly recommend all of you attend, um, where the companies will be able to perform. And also I have a project that I'm working on specifically for that performance, which I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, and the lastly, project development. So I developed a plan for two creative projects, one which um, could possibly extend to the fall, but the other one is focused on right now for our Navy peer performance, which is an archival booth. So for the Navy peer, performance, I am developing an archival booth um, titled Just Tribe a Legacy, a Chicago Black Dance Legacy Project archival booth. So this will hit three main um, things. So there will be a retractable banner for each company um, to really highlight their history. Um, and also include like an icon iconic quote from uh, that particular company. Um, there will also be a binder, including some of the newspaper clippings, images, programs I've collected over the summer, um, and also collected from the companies one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Whenever I've been able to met with them, they've been able to give me some things as well. Um, and lastly, an oral history component where me and a volunteer are developing a list of questions, interview questions, to conduct many oral histories to capture the embodiment of how the audience is feeling at this event, and also to capture any other stories that people may have around the dance companies. This is a little outline at a presentation with the BMRC and my supervisor a couple of weeks ago, outlining what these banners might look like. So we really want to capture where they started and where they are now. And also just like some of the amazing quotes and uh, words that they've been saying all summer as I've been able to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. So this internship has been truly amazing. I um, danced when I was in when I was two years old until I graduated high school. So just a little bit of time. And I'm very passionate about history as well, African-American history especially. And so I never thought to combine the two together um, until I had this internship. And so it's been wonderful. One, hearing the stories of the founders of the dance company and also hearing some of the struggles that they've had in regards to COVID and recovering. Um, and also just learning more of the background work around having a dance studio, because um, that's knowledge that I did not have. I was just a company member. I was not aware of like some of the background work, especially uh, the work that has to be done as a Black dance studio and being under like appreciated by the city. Um, I've also greatly appreciated the work that the BMRC has done in regards to the informational interviews that some of the interns have mentioned earlier and the workshops. 
Um, it's definitely expanded my idea of what I could do after undergraduate, uh, after my undergrad career. I've always wanted to be an educator, but now I think that's shifting a little bit. Um, I've been really interested in having the one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction with the documents and conducting the mini oral histories and just really gathering those stories and making sure that they're preserved correctly and that those like stories and legacies um, are documented and preserved. So I really enjoyed that experience and I'm hoping to possibly continue that after undergraduate career. Um, and so, yeah, I've been entirely grateful for the people I've met, the experiences that I've had. Um, and this has just been a wonderful internship all around, but that's all I have. Thank you, Hope. And that, that's the last presentation. We do want, we have probably about five minutes and we do want to open the floor for any questions. Um, all of, let me just say that all of the all of the interns have um, been reporting all along in my conversations with them um, the kind of a, a, a richness of the experiences that they have had at um, both CHM and at Northwestern. And I really want to thank um, the supervisors, um, also um, with the Chicago Black Dance Legacy Project, that would be Princess Cooper, and CHM, who worked with um, Jordan Wright, was Angela Hoover, and some of them are here with us. And also at CHM, Angela Solis, who worked directly with um, Rebecca Otto, and then the two, um, our two um, BMRC interns, Callie and Lee, who worked who worked at um, Northwestern under Florence Mugambi and Charlotte Wilson. So I just wanted to take a minute to thank all of them. Um, does anyone have questions for any one of our interns? Let me check chat because there might be, oh, just a lot of compliments and thank yous. They really were wonderful presentations. And um, I am so, I've been so excited all summer. This has been a highlight. This group of interns have been a real highlight for me this summer. Um, if there aren't any questions, I'll just throw one out there and anybody can jump in. Um, what might have been something that was the most surprising for you this summer um, in your work? I can answer quickly. Um, being able to see the, the Library of African Studies um, in person was great because I like reading and of course seeing an entire like room dedicated to the subject matter that yourself are interested in which isn't really um which isn't really centered in a lot of other libraries was very impactful just to know that there is a place where you can have like a place dedicated to like scholarship that you're in, that you're interested in I can also speak to that a little bit. Um, I was, and I've mentioned this in my presentation, I was just genuinely surprised by the robust sense of community. I was still able to experience in spite of everything being on Zoom, everything being remote. <laughs> um, and just even the like continuation of my internship is over, um, but I've already connected and talked to a few people who are very supportive along the way at Chicago History Museum. And so the next time I'm in that area, I'm gonna stop by and get lunch with somebody, get coffee with somebody else. And just the, the carryover that that has, especially for professional development was huge. Wonderful. Yeah, I completely agree with the fact of the community is great and fantastic. It's like, a little magical community of people who are also nice and like willing to help out. It's fantastic. Um, one other thing I was surprised about um, during the interview process is how good the memories of our narrators were. 
fantastic. The detail that they got into was like insane. I was like, I hope I have this good of a memory when I'm <laughs> however old. I don't know, <laughs> but it was really nice. That's awesome. Allison, I was just going to make a comment if that was okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, oh, right. <laughs> my name is Princess Moon and I worked with Hope um, Houston in the Chicago Black Dance Legacy Project and I can remember being a, a young student um, at Howard University and then I went on to receive my master's in public history and I wanted to say congratulations to all of you for amazing and beautiful work and as I was listening to you I just kind of this phrase was just in my head of keepers of the flame, meaning the work that you're doing, you are creating history for future generations because, you know, one of the things that I reflected on Hope is that she's, a lot of what she's doing is capturing real life history right now for our project, but you all are also doing a lot of work where you're digging back and documenting and helping to tell those stories for generations to come, which, you know, it breaks down those silos and those barriers that we're working so hard to, to, to do and to understand each other as a human race. So I thought it was fantastic and hope is amazing, but I think that each one of you are as well. So that's my two cents and my observation. Thank you for that, Princess. And I certainly agree. We um, often do think of interns as, um, you know, some adding value, yes, but um, sometimes we um, forget just, just how much. I mean, they are learning, but they are contributing. And so, absolutely, I agree with you. I do want to say it's two o'clock. If there aren't any other questions, 